evening, everyone. If you will go ahead and stand with us as we worship. Sure. 
God, I thank you that you are so, so worthy of all of our praise. God, it is easy to praise you. It's easy to find things to worship you, Lord. God, you are holy and there is none like you, and we praise you. To your name I pray, amen.
Amen. Please be seated. Wow, what a great return tonight. So encouraged to see so many of you back, excited for what God's going to say to us and do in our midst in these days. Team, come on up. We want to take a minute now and let our team very quickly introduce themselves. They're excited to get to know you and build relationships in the short time that we have. Now, you may say, Greg, where do you find 21 responsible, committed young adults willing to commit a year of their lives to travel with Life Action Ministry. Well, we find them in places like Grove, Oklahoma, actually. We, uh, most of our team members come from churches where we've held events. They like what they see. They uh, uh, want to maybe have carve out a gap year after high school, before college, and, and just pursue the Lord with uh, a, almost a reckless abandon. So we are excited to be able to talk with you also about a future with Life Action. Later this week, you'll hear an announcement. There'll be an information meeting after the services one night. Uh, students, you'd be welcome to come, parents, and we'd love to be uh, able to answer questions and get you thinking, praying about traveling with Life Action Ministries. All right, we're going to start with the Paulus family over here. Well, hello again this evening. We are the Paulus family from Buchanan, Michigan. My name is Brent. Uh, we serve as the family revivalist on this team. This is our 15th year with Life Action, our fourth year traveling on the road. The rest of my family is going to introduce themselves to you. I'm Maggie, and I'm the mama. This is Sam, and he is seven years old. This is Haven, and she's four, and she's holding Max. That's her favorite animal. And my other uh, kids are going to introduce themselves. Hey, guys. I'm Gideon. I'm 12 years old. Hi, y'all. I'm Hope. I'm 10 years old, and I'm in base camp. We're so excited to be seeking the Lord with you here this week. Hi guys, I'm Rebecca Russ. Um, this is my first year traveling as the family assistant for the Paulus family, and I'm from McClenny, Florida. Hi, my name is Heidi Williams, and I'm from Atlantic, Iowa. This is my second year traveling as a children's minister in Happy Heart City. Now, in Happy Heart City, we are junior detectives helping Detective Do Right find the missing keys to the city while learning the same biblical principles that you guys are learning in here. We also get to play games and sing songs and learn Bible verses. Hi guys, I'm Hallie Mc McBride, I'm from Savannah, Georgia, and this is my first year traveling on the Red Team as a children's minister in Happy Heart City. I'm Emma Bullock, I'm from Hickory, North Carolina, this is my second year traveling as a children's minister in Happy Heart City. Hi, my name is Ben Howard, I'm a children's minister in Base Camp, and I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. This is my second year traveling, but in Base Camp, we're getting to learn the same biblical principles you learn in here, but by watching Piper go on a thirst quest, let me tell you, it's quite entertaining. Hey, y'all. I'm Randy Allen, and I'm from Oakland, Tennessee. And this is my second year traveling, and I'm a children's minister in base camp. But this week, I get to be with the youth. What's up, y'all? My name is Destiny Triple. I'm from Coldwater, Mississippi. And this is my first year traveling as a teacher in base camp. Hi, my name is Faith Durham. I'm from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. And this is my second year getting to teach in base camp. Hey guys, my name is Austin Shields. Uh, I'm from Red Oak, Texas, and this is my first year traveling as youth revivalist. Hey y'all, my name is Michaela Friend. I serve as a team administrator. I'm from Oakland, Maryland, and this is my third year traveling. Hey y'all, my name is Katie Hunter. This is my third year traveling. I'm the business manager, and I'm from Borger, Texas. All right, I'll let you welcome the first half of our team here. Hello everyone, my name is Katherine Johnson. This is my first year traveling as a violinist in the worship band and I'm from Fletcher, Oklahoma. Hey everyone, I'm Olivia Orsag. I'm from DeMont, Indiana and this is my first year traveling as a vocalist. Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Orsag. I'm also from DeMont, Indiana. This is my third year traveling as the drummer and this year I also get to serve as the team manager. Hey church, my name is Hudson Tolleson. I'm from DeMott, Indiana too. Um, this is my second year traveling on the red team as worship leader. Hey y'all, my name is Ashley Johnson. I am from Dothan, Alabama, and this is my second year traveling as vocalist on the worship team. Hey, my name is Graham Harris. I'm from Covington, Georgia. This is my first year traveling as the bass guitarist. I'm Jessica Wishard. I'm from Monticello, Arkansas. This is my second year traveling. This year, I'm the music director and the pianist. What's up, guys? My name is Drew Plyler. I'm from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. This is my second year traveling, and I play electric guitar. 
Now turn your attention to the back corner over here. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew DeWeird. I serve on Red Team as the media tech. I'm from St. Joseph, Michigan, and this is my first year traveling. Hey everybody, my name is Zach McIntyre, and I'm the audio technician. I'm from Temple, Georgia, and this is my first year traveling. All right, would you welcome my worship team, please? All right, at this time, we're going to dismiss our children to their clubs. We're going to start with Happy Heart City. So if you're in Happy Heart City, you're going to head over here. You see Heidi over here, over to my far left, your right. There's Heidi, and she is excited to take your kids back to Happy Heart City. Base Camp is also in the back right here. You see them enthusiastically waving. If you're in Base Camp, head out that door, please. Wouldn't we all like to go and hang out in a place called Happy Heart City? Doesn't that sound attractive in these days? All right, as our children are leaving, team members are handing out several things to you. One of those things will be a prayer card. So as soon as you get your prayer card, go ahead and turn to the prayer side. There are two sides, prayers on one side, prayer requests, praises on the other side. Now, we know that prayer is foundational to any lasting work of God. Several of you have shared with us that you've been praying for us in expectation for our arrival and for these uh, conference services. We're going to continue to saturate these services with prayer. As a team, we're committing to pray for you. We'll be passing out prayer cards tonight, Monday night, and Tuesday night. And throughout the next day, team members will be praying through each and every prayer card. So let's start with your first prayer request tonight. I know there's lots of things on your heart. We know America needs revival. The church in America needs revival. We know that you know of people who are hurting and sick and in need. Well, let's make our first prayer request a personal prayer request. That's all right to do that. Here's my question for you that I want you to answer on your prayer card. What do you need most from God right now? You personally, what do you need most from God right now? Perhaps this week, in the course of these services, God's going to begin to answer that prayer request or perhaps even reshape it into a request that is in perfect alignment with his will. So you're gonna have about 15 minutes before I call for those prayer cards. I'll do that at the beginning of the message. So everybody get your prayer card ready. Brent, you've got some more announcements for us. Well, good evening again tonight. Glad to be back here with you. Just wanna remind you about our service times coming up uh, tomorrow. We will be gathering here, not at six o'clock, but at 6.30 p.m. So if you are bringing kids with you, make sure you come about 15 minutes early. You come at 6.30. Um, get them checked into clubs like you did last night. Same area in the lobby. Bring them into the worship center with you for a time of worship together. Then we'll send them off to clubs. But 6.30 uh, tomorrow night is when we'll have our services together. Uh, Maggie, talk about what's coming up again on Tuesday. Yes, Tuesday from 11.30 to 1. We are hosting a ladies' luncheon. So if you are in the room and you're a lady and you're from like high school on up, you are invited. Also, your neighbor is invited and your coworker is invited. Invite your friends if you want, it's super laid back. Um, we're just gonna center together and eat some good food and um, Lord Will and Patty's gonna share her story with you, which is really beautiful and helpful. And so um, we are gonna have childcare, so don't let that hold you back. Um, if you do bring your kiddos, um, just be sure to pack them a little lunch, and we'll try to have our team members feed them peanut butter or jelly or whatever you pack in there for them. Uh, we do need to know how many are coming, so there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. If you don't mind to just stick your name on there, that'll help us a lot. But we really, really hope you get to come. All right. Thank you again, ladies. Make sure you sign up. Be thinking about who you can invite to that time. Come when you can. Leave when you need to. If you can just come for 30 minutes, I believe that may be an impactful time for you or your guest uh, during that time on Tuesday. Again, sign up in the lobby for that ladies' luncheon on Tuesday. Team members are coming by to pass out one of those styrofoam cups. Everybody in the room needs one of those. This is part of our exercise tonight. Don't worry, we're not gonna make you drink the Kool-Aid, okay? So um, just in case you're wondering, this will be a part of our exercise this evening. If you still need a cup, raise your hand up high. Team members can get those to you. Team, there's some over in this section over here. Make sure they get one of those cups. If you need a cup, again, raise your hand up high. Team members are coming by to pass those out to you. I want to encourage you, if you're watching online or if you're in this room, to download the Life Action app. A lot of the resources that were passed out 
Um, if you're watching online, this is a great way for you to engage in the conference with us. Uh, there's a way for you to submit digital online prayer cards through that Life Action app available on the App Store and Google Play. Just download that, go to the Events tab, and click the Submit Prayer Request option. You can engage. We'd love to be interceding for you that are watching online at home as well. Uh, we'll be also posting a link to uh, the digital copy of our Thirst Conference notebook here in a few moments so that you can engage in the conference with us. If you're in the room, there's also great content available on that app for you uh, throughout our days together and after our conference includes. I encourage you to check out that Life Action app. If you're in the room and need a Thirst Conference notebook, raise your hand up high. You forgot yours or lost it from the morning or it's your first time with us here this evening, raise your hand up high. Team members can get you one of those Thirst Conference notebooks tonight. Keep the hand up high. Team members will find you, pass those out to you as well this evening. I want to encourage you to go ahead and pull out that love offering envelope that our team members passed out a few minutes ago. I want to walk you through the process of how we see God provide for our needs over the course of a conference like this. Again, we uh, faithfully have seen God provide for our ministry for over 50 years. Uh, Live Action has been around since the early 70s, and we've seen God faithfully allow us to continue to serve local churches in events like this. Uh, as we uh, continue to let you know about those needs, you'll get an opportunity uh, to hear and to partner with us in that process. I know we're new to many of you all, so we just want to walk you through a few things that we believe, believe about giving before telling you how you can maybe partner with us uh, throughout the course of our time here together. On the front of that envelope, there's these three statements that what we believe statements is what we call our giving philosophy. Here's the first one. We believe it is our responsibility as a life action team ministering to you all during these days as God leads us to inform people of our needs. That's our role in this journey together is that as we have needs as a ministry team serving your congregation this week, uh, it's our job, our responsibility to let you know what those needs are. I'll kind of inform you on what the monetary amount of that is and looks like here in a few moments. Second giving philosophy, so thankful about this. It is God's responsibility to prompt believers to give. I'm glad that it's not my job or Greg's job uh, to prompt you to give to our love offering to partner with us this week. It's not Pastor Jim or any of the pastor staff's job to help you know what to give to the local needs here of, the, of the, the church here. It is only God's responsibility to prompt believers to give. Third and final one, this is for all of us together. It is the responsibility of God's people, that's you, that's me, that's all of us, to respond in obedience to his prompting and develop a lifestyle of Christ-like scriptural giving, believing that in our journey and our Christian walk, there are times when God lays things on our heart where he says, hey, I will have an opportunity. I'd like you to join in this adventure with me. Will you say yes to, with me in this opportunity that I'm inviting you into? It's our responsibility to respond, to say yes to that invitation and develop a lifestyle of Christ-like scriptural giving. Throughout the course of our evenings, Monday through Wednesday night, we'll spend a little bit of time every service talking about how do we cultivate a lifestyle of Christ-like scriptural giving. A few facts about our ministry, again, because we know that we're new to you, some things we want you to know about our organization before you decide whether you want to partner with us and whether God would invite you to be a part of this journey alongside us. We are not underwritten by a foundation or denomination. We're not a part of the Southern Baptist Convention or the cooperative program. Nothing wrong with that. We are an independent, uh, denom we are not a denominational um, organization. Uh, nothing wrong with denominations. Uh, we partner with lots of Southern Baptist churches. We just find that gives us opportunity to minister in a variety of settings by being non-denominational. Um, so we don't have a, any large foundation or denomination that makes our ministry possible. We don't have a rich uncle that writes us a check when things get tight, okay? Guys like Donald Trump and Warren Buffett, all right, they are not on our donor list, okay? But let me in, let you know a little secret here. If God would lay it on their heart and they want to respond in Christ-like scriptural giving, we would welcome their gift, okay? Just being transparent there uh, for a moment. But by and large, we see these needs provided for as a ministry team through individuals and families and churches like you who partner with our ministry after being impacted. Your gift will go towards the ongoing operational expenses. That means this, if you partner with us in our love offering this week, you are helping to pay it forward. We're here this week because other individuals and other churches over the course of this year and the last 50 years have been so impacted by a life action event that they said, we want to pay it forward and allow another church to experience this. Your church paid a small scheduling fee, I believe, to have us here, but by and large, the majority of our expenses are covered by you all as a church family who decide in their hearts that they want to see another church, another family, another individual impacted by these life-changing truths. Third and final one, most important of them all, I think, my favorite one to share every week. Our road team staff are all missionaries who raise their own support. 
Maggie and our family, Greg and Patty, and all of those team members that you just met a few minutes ago, we are all here serving the Lord faithfully as missionaries. We have individuals, family members, friends back home, people we've met along the way who have partnered with us, allowing us to serve you here this week. That means that not a single penny of the love offering will benefit any of us personally. It just covers the operational cost for us to be able to serve you here this week. Greg doesn't benefit from the offering. I don't benefit from the offering. Our team members don't. It simply allows us to conduct another conference somewhere down the road. We are all missionaries here this week who have raised their own support to be able to faithfully serve you all as a church family this week. So what are our conference team needs? What is the amount that we uh, feel led in our heart to share with you, to be praying about giving over the course of these days that we're together? Uh, The annual cost to keep just our team on the road is about $400,000 a year. We know that's a big number. Uh, We believe with doing things with excellence and uh, there's a lot of cost that goes into being able to to travel the country, to provide all the equipment that you see here, uh, the food to be able to feed our team as we're traveling about, the vehicles that you see parked out there, both of the RVs, the big bus, the semi-truck, Uh, The ongoing equipment that you see here in this space and throughout our kids' ministry and other places, the ongoing maintenance of that equipment, the insurance costs, etc., that equates to about $14,000 for a one-week event like we're here this week. So that's what we're trusting God to provide. We know that's a big number, but we serve a really big God, and we've seen God faithfully provide week in and week out uh, for those needs to be able to continue sharing these life-changing truth with churches across the country. If you feel led to give this week, this envelope is one of the great ways to be able to do that. Uh, if you want to give through that, there's opportunity to give by cash or check made out to Life Action Ministries, credit or debit card in that envelope. If you're watching online, you can go to lifeaction.org slash donate. If you're in the room, you can do that as well. Opportunity to give through that Life Action app I mentioned a minute ago. Sometimes in the course of a conference like this, uh, somebody feels led to give something that's not monetary in nature. It doesn't fit in an envelope or you can't give it online. If you feel led this week, God lays in your heart to give something that does not uh, easily transfer uh, in that way, you can come talk to Greg or I about a non-cash gift and we'll tell you how to help facilitate that gift. Two prayers I want you to pray over that love offering envelope, okay? So I want you to put this somewhere this week, maybe on your nightstand, maybe in your Bible, somewhere you're gonna see it often. I want you to just start praying this week two prayers. First one is this, you may wanna write this down on the envelope. God, what would you have me to give? Believing there may be something that God has entrusted to your care, and as you hear those principles taught this week about developing a lifestyle of Christ-like scripture giving, that he will lay something on your heart that he have you give back to him as an offering to him. So first prayer is this, God, what would you have me to give? Second is like it, God, to whom would you have me to give it? Now maybe God would lead you this week to partner with us in our love offering, and we would celebrate that and be so thankful to receive that gift to help us to continue on ministering in churches Maybe this week what God would have you to do is to give more to your local church needs, the ongoing budget needs here at the church. Maybe there's a missionary or a mission organization that you know that has needs right now and you want to partner with them in a new way. Maybe there's an individual in the church or in your family or in this community that you know has financial needs right now and God would lead you to partner with them. However God would lead you, we're going to celebrate that act of obedience as you say yes to God in the area of giving this week. So again, those two prayers, God, what would you have me to give? To whom would you have me to give it? Our goal together in this love offering journey and all the resources we'll be promoting throughout this week is this. We just want to see lives change and advance the Great Commission. So thankful to be a part of a ministry that for 50 years has been a part of seeing life-changing works in people's lives. And I believe that this week God has more of that in store for us as we seek the Lord together. Pastor Jim, come give us a welcome greeting tonight. Pray for us as we continue on our service. It is my privilege to welcome you here tonight, and uh, we had an opportunity before the services started. I met some individuals from North Carolina who are here in their RV and uh, in the area for a few months, and we appreciate that tonight. Uh, Those of you who are uh, visiting from the community or you may be from another church or whatever, we appreciate you being here tonight, as well as our uh, regular members. Thank you for being faithful and coming back tonight. We're also privileged to have our Director of Missions of Northeastern Baptist Association and his wife, uh, Brother Scott and Beth Hill. Actually, he's Dr. Scott Hill, but he doesn't do surgeries, okay? So just want you all to know that, okay? So we appreciate them being with us here tonight as well. Thank you for being faithful today in the service this morning. We were blessed. If you were here, you know that. We were touched, and we want God to do it again tonight. So let's bow and ask the Lord to be with us here. 
Our Father, you are holy. You are righteous. And you are loving. And Father, I believe that you desire through your Son, Jesus Christ, you have a relationship with people. You loved us so much that you were willing to send your son to die on the cross for our sins. I'm not sure we'll ever be able to thank you enough. But Lord, one way is to give you our lives. So Lord, we give ourselves to you tonight. And we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would have complete freedom in this place move in our hearts touch our emotions Lord uh, touch our beings and help us Lord to respond we know that the word of God is going to be preached we know that this worship is God honored so Father tonight you do what you desire to do and help us, Lord, we, would, we want to get out of the way and let you move. Thank you, Father, for this privilege of being here tonight. The needs that are here meet those needs. And help us to say yes to you. In Christ's name that we pray, amen. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to continue to worship and to sing. We're going to sing a song that is most likely unfamiliar to most of the people in this room. It's called Death Was Arrested. And I just want to set it up a little bit by reading some scripture regarding about what this, what this song is about. In John chapter 8, we have the story of the woman who is caught in adultery. And a group of Pharisees and religious leaders bring her before Jesus. And they say, the law of Moses commands that we stone her. What do you think we should do? Um, and he goes down and he writes something in the ground. And in verse 7 it says, As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw the stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and he said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And in so many ways, I find myself, like I identify with the woman <laughs> in this story. She's brought before a bunch of people that don't have a right to condemn her. They're sinners just like she is, but she's confronted with the one who does have a right to condemn her. Jesus is holy. He is God. And he says, I don't condemn you. Every Christian in this room has a similar story. We, were, we met with the holy God and he said, I don't condemn you. My son died for you. John chapter one says, for from his fullness, from Jesus' fullness, we've received grace upon grace. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus, Jesus Christ. We have received such mercy. And that's what this song is about. It's about the mercy that you and I get to live in, the new life that you and I get to live in. So let's sing. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to be Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains My orphan heart was giving her My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes
I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was erased so be faithful He canceled my debt and he called me his friend That sin death was arrested and my life seated. Somebody needed that song tonight. You needed to be reminded of the promise of 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any person is in Christ, he, she is a what? New creation. All things are passed away. All things have become new. The world lies to us and tells us that's the way you're born. That's the way you are. You just, that's what you have to learn to live with. But the promise of God's grace is that we can be changed. We can be conformed into the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. So a great reminder in music tonight. Take your prayer cards, pass those to these inside aisles. Team members coming by to pick those up. If we miss you, just wave them. We'll find you. Students, we're going to dismiss you at this time. You head to your area. And you'll enjoy the rest of the evening with Austin and several of our team members. So students, you can head out. The rest of us, a quick video here to introduce the message tonight. Idols always serve a purpose, not God's purpose, of course, but our own. They tell us what we want to hear, promise to fulfill our wishes or fill in the blanks of our emptiness. 
Sometimes we fashion them in our own image, sometimes in the image of others. They represent our hopes, our fears, or our worst passions. Beautiful in the beginning, ugly in the end. Idols can be anything, anywhere. Anything that takes God's rightful place in our lives. Anything that we turn to for satisfaction outside of His love and grace. Idols are substitutes, plain and simple. Money and pleasure, sex and drugs, traditions, sports and family, freedom, ministry, nature and power, fame, career, possessions, food, anything, even good things, can take God's place as central in our hearts. But substitute gods are no gods at all. Substitutes lead to slavery, to sorrow, and to separation from God. Jesus, the thirst quencher, is the one our souls long for. He is the one who deserves our best affection. We must seek Him, love Him, turn to Him. We must leave substitutes behind and start living the life Jesus died and rose again to provide. We began this morning with this premise. God created you with a spiritual thirst that only he can satisfy. We saw that lived out in that passage in John 4, that thirst-quenching encounter that that woman at the well had with the Lord Jesus. Remember, that water jar that she brought to the well that day was a picture of her soul, empty and dry. But for the first time in her life, she tasted living water, God's eternal life, forgiveness and grace and mercy and God's power in her life, and it changed her. Now, up to that point, she had been trying to find fulfillment, trying to fill that emptiness through different means. She had looked into relationships. We talked about that. She thought, if I could just find the right man, I'll be a happy person. She tried to substitute human religion for a relationship, a real vital relationship with God through his son, the Lord Jesus. So we're going to explore a little bit more tonight this idea of substitutes. Tonight, tomorrow night, we're looking specifically at obstacles. What is hindering us from experiencing God's satisfying work in our lives, God's fulfilling work in our lives? And we're going to see that for some tonight, it is the matter of substitutes. Turn with me in your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 2. Now, I can help you find it pretty quick. Open your Bible to the middle. You'll find the book of Psalms. Starts with a P, but pronounced Psalms. And then move to your right. Proverbs, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and you're going to go through Isaiah and then the prophecies of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 2, your workbook is page 8. Well, some years ago, I uh, began to notice that uh, as I was aging, my, my body was beginning to change a little bit. I was a skinny guy for years and years, could eat whatever I wanted, and well, then things started to just kind of stick, you know, and so I knew I needed to probably change my eating habits. I, I have this massive sweet tooth, so I needed to explore artificial substitutes, some sugar substitutes. Well, I, you know, I began to do a little bit of research out there, and I found that uh, some of these uh, sugar substitutes, unfortunately, bring with them some unwanted side effects. And well, I noticed, for instance, that, that with some, there was possibly a link to a cancer-causing agent, to others possibly a link to uh, uh, arthritis and those kinds of uh, issues. And oh, what was that third one? Oh yes, memory loss. There was another one that was related to memory loss. Now you know my substitute of choice. Now, here's what I've learned about substitutes. Number one, they're never as good as the real thing. <laughs> you can always tell the difference. But number two, they often bring with them unwanted side effects. Here's your thirst truth tonight. Go ahead and jot it down. We must identify and turn from our substitutes in order to experience lasting satisfaction. We're going to do that in the course of our time together tonight. We're going to identify specific substitutes. 
things that have been distracting us, things that have been deceiving us and lying to us and distracting us from pursuing God in the way that he needs to be pursued from our perspective. And we're going to discover tonight again the reality of God's power to break the grip that those substitutes have on us. Now, I'm using the word substitute, but from this point on, I'm going to switch to the biblical term, which is idolatry. Let's say you and I were talking earlier before the service, and you said, Greg, what are you preaching on tonight? And I said, tonight I'm going to preach on idols. Now, you may think, well, that, that's kind of interesting. I know that the Bible talks about idolatry. I've read stories in the Old Testament and the New Testament where people struggled with idolatry. But, Greg, is that really relevant to my life today? Come on, Greg, is that really something that is an issue for me today? With all the things that I'm struggling with, are you sure that idolatry is really that important? Here's my sad news, friends. Like it or not, idolatry is alive and well in 21st century America. Now, it may not look like the idolatry of the Old Testament, but I'm going to show you that it is idolatry. Now, keep your finger there in Jeremiah 2. We'll get there in just a moment. Let me start with the familiar passage, Exodus 20. Now, when you hear Exodus 20, think 10. Because in Exodus 20, we have the initial listing of what we call the Ten Commandments. Now, God is not a simple being. He is infinitely complex, far more complex than our little finite minds can begin to fully grasp. But when he deals with us, he deals with us in simple terms because he knows we are simple. What could be more simple than God saying, here are 10 things that represent who I am. Each of those 10 commandments are rooted in the nature of God, his person, what we call his attributes, his character qualities. Here are 10 things that represent who I am and what I value. You want to hang with me? You want to have a relationship with me? You have to honor these 10 things. And so we begin reading the first of those 10 commandments, Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. Then commandment number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, an idol. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now pause a moment. The first two of the Ten Commandments deal exclusively with the sin of idolatry. The the prohibition of worshiping any other God in place of or alongside God And then the prohibition against any kind of idolatry. Now, again, let's put it in perspective. Ten things God says, here's who I am, here's what I value. Of those ten things, the first two deal exclusively with idolatry. Now, that means 20%, one-fifth of the ten things God says, here's who I am, deal exclusively with idolatry. But someone, I think, has correctly pointed out, you can't really break any of the other eight without having first broken the first or second commandment. Again, some of you are still struggling a little bit, seeing the relevance of biblical teaching on idolatry with where you are today. Here's what we need to do. We need to redefine our understanding of idolatry. So I'm going to give you our working definition. This is what we're going to use tonight. Idolatry is anything we value equally or more then we value God. Anything we value equally are more than we value God. Now, as I said earlier, the idolatry that is rampant in our nation today doesn't necessarily look like the idolatry that we see in the Old and New Testament, but it is in its essence idolatry, and it's a major hindrance. It's a major distraction to you and I pursuing God as he desires to be pursued. See what you think about this quote from Paul David Tripp. The desire for a good thing has become a bad thing when that desire has become a ruling thing. One of the subtle issues regarding the sin of idolatry, anything has the potential to become an idol. Anything, even something that is essentially good, something that is needful, something that is necessary for life, Even something that is essentially good has the potential to become bad, to become detrimental if it usurps Christ's rightful place 
as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in our lives. I was preaching in Picayune, Mississippi. Yeah, there is a place called Picayune, Mississippi, quaint little town there in South Mississippi. We were in the First Baptist Church. It was a county seat, First Baptist Church, having a thirst conference. God was moving. Tuesday night of the conference, the pastor stood before the congregation. Again, I had preached on idolatry on Sunday night. Tuesday night, he stood before the congregation and he said, I need to confess something to you. He said, I have created an idol in my life and you have become that idol. Even though the church is a good thing in his life, the church had become a negative thing because he had allowed his congregation to become an idol. In what way? Here's what he confessed to them. For the past few years, I've been plagiarizing. I've been preaching other men's sermons. I was so hungry for your approval. I was so hungry for the attaboys that you were giving me that I was taking other men's sermons and I was claiming that they were my own. Now that was a risky thing for him to do. To their credit, they gave him a standing ovation and affirmed him with forgiveness. See, even a good thing has the potential to become a bad thing if it becomes a ruling thing in our lives. All right, you've been waiting for me patiently in Jeremiah chapter two. Uh, Some quick background. Jeremiah was one of the Old Testament prophets, those unique individuals whom God called to be his mouthpiece to the people. And Jeremiah was God's mouthpiece to the people. He would say, thus says the Lord, and then he would communicate to them God's direct truth, God's direct revelation. Now, Jeremiah was living at a very challenging time in human history, especially for the Jewish nation, that community of faith. For uh, decades, God had been warning the Jewish people regarding idolatry. There would be seasons where where revival would come and the people would repent of their idolatry, return to the Lord, but ultimately they would go back again to that sin of idolatry and it distanced them farther and farther from God and finally judgment came. I know we're not big on Bible dates, but here's one you need to remember. 587 BC, 587 years before Christ, judgment comes. It comes in the form of the empire, the Babylonian empire that invades Israel, conquers the nation, uh, massacres scores of people, takes uh, uh, masses of others and and, uh, uh, they become slaves and they completely destroyed the temple there that Solomon had constructed that was the heart of their of their Jewish worship. Now Jeremiah is living through all of this. He's watching it happen. And he has this unenviable task to answer this question. Jeremiah, why has God done this? Why has God allowed this to happen? And so what we have in Jeremiah 2 is God's response to their question. Why has this disaster fallen on us? So Jeremiah 2, look at verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the clans of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, what wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and went after worthlessness and became worthless? Now pause a moment. Parents, here's a good coaching tip for you tonight. When you have to deal with your children in a disciplinary setting, don't lead with accusations. Lead with questions. Accusations tend to harden the will. Questions speak to the conscience and they tend to open the heart of the child. Again, God, the perfect parent, he responds to their question with his question. Now, it's a facetious question. What wrong did your fathers find in me that they went far from me? Where did I let you down? Where did I not keep my covenant promises that I had made to you? What flaw did you find in me that you left me, that you went far from me? Now, obviously, the flaw was not in God. The flaw was in their hearts. This is an interesting phrase. He he says, you went after worthlessness and became worthless. The New American Standard, I know that's your translation, Pastor. They walked after emptiness and they became empty. Now, Matt's not with us tonight. He's had his son 
Tyler's ordination in Oklahoma City. We're celebrating with him. But if Matt were here and teaching us about worship, here's what he would remind us. Number one, everybody worships. Everybody worships. I can say that with authority because God created us with the desire to worship. Now, not everybody worships the true and living God. Not everybody worships according to the standards of Scripture, but everybody worships. And then here's the second takeaway on worship. You become like what you worship. You become like what you worship. If God is the sole object of our worship as he should be, we're becoming conformed to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. We're, we're becoming more like him. But when I allow others to enter in and they become the objects of my worship, I become empty as those things are empty. Skip down to verse 11 with me. We've got more questions. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now pause. Again, another question, facetious question. Has a nation changed its God? Essentially, what they did was to trade in their God. They didn't want Jehovah God anymore. They didn't want to worship the true and living God, the one that rescued them out of Egypt, the one that gave them the conquest of Canaan, the one who had provided for them and protected them for generations. But they decided, we don't want that God anymore. They've traded in for a different God. What is God's reaction to our idolatry? Verse 12, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. Now, in verse 13, we have God's answer to this question. Why has this disaster fallen on us? Why have you allowed this to happen? Here's God's re response to that. My people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. There's again our thirst theme. Every passage that we'll use this week will pursue this thirst theme. You get this picture again, echoes of John 4 from this morning. God describes himself as the fountain of living water. So here is answer number one. Why have you been judged? Because you've left me. You've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And then the second reason. You've hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Well, I see that. I asked the question, what's a cistern? Well, let me show you. Pastor and I were talking today about his trip to Israel. You probably saw some of these. If you were to go to Israel, you would see a cistern like this. Now, what they're able to do, the soft limestone rock, they can carve out large tanks, tanks that can hold literally thousands of gallons of water. And then they carve into the surrounding area channels so that when the rain comes and it comes sparsely there it's it's rare there but when it comes you want to capture it so they can literally fill up this tank in uh, in a number of hours if it's a significant rainfall here's another sister and this one's actually underground you can see that they've carved steps into the wall along the side so that as the water level drops they still have access to the water now what is jeremiah saying you've traded in me the fountain of living waters You've created substitutes, your idols. The problem is, he says, your cisterns are broken. They don't work. They don't satisfy. They don't hear your prayers. They can't offer you forgiveness, peace, satisfaction. They are dead and empty. Let me update it. Let me give you a, a modern day picture of what Jeremiah was saying. Let's say you've been at the gym working out. You got a sweat going, you know, your cotton mouth, so you need to satisfy that thirst. Just a few feet from you on the wall, there's a water fountain. Just a few feet in the push of a button, and you have instant access to cool, filtered water. Instead, you walk past the water fountain. You walk out the door. You walk into the street. You get down on your knees, and you drink from the filth of the gutter. 
That's what he says. You've forsaken the fountain of living waters and you're drinking from the gutters, trying to satisfy yourself, trying to find fulfillment. Well, again, as I've said, the idolatry that we see today doesn't look exactly like the idolatry that we see in the Old and New Testament, but it is idolatry. I want us to look very briefly at five modern American idols, all right? And again, when we finished our journey here, we're going to come back and we're going to revisit the question, are there idols in my life? And the answer may surprise you. Well, let's start with the first idol, the idol of pleasure. And with each of these, I'll give a few illustrations. Food, sex, exercise, alcohol, tobacco, prescription, non-prescription drugs. Now, immediately someone says, "Uh, wait a minute, Greg. Some of those things aren't bad. They're actually good. They're needful. They're necessary. Remember what we're working with in our ongoing definition of idolatry. Even a good thing becomes a bad thing if it becomes a ruling thing in our lives. Let's take food, for instance. How about the phrase comfort food? Now, when I think of comfort food, I think of Cracker Barrel. Patty and I travel in an RV and one of the few restaurants that have parking spaces that can accommodate our RVs are Cracker Barrel. So we spend lots of time in Cracker Barrel. Any Cracker Barrel fans in the room? I'm just curious. Yeah, lots of hands there. Now, so when I think of comfort food, I think of Cracker Barrel. Probably not the most healthy food, right? But enjoyable. But for someone in the room, the phrase comfort food has a different meaning. See, you find your comfort in food. Rather than finding comfort in and through the comforter, God himself, you find your comfort, you find your fulfillment, or you attempt to, in and through food. Let's talk about human sexuality. What a precious gift that God has given to us. As he designed the marriage covenant, a relationship unique to a man and a woman, a relationship that allows them to bond on the deepest level. He intended that that sexual relationship in that marriage covenant be a means by which they could enjoy intimacy and oneness on the deepest levels. But watch, when I take sex outside of God's intended purpose, when I take sex outside of marriage, when I seek sexual fulfillment in different ways through pornography or adultery or an affair. When I take sex out of marriage, that precious gift of God becomes destructive in my life. Someone's described it like this. If the fire's in the fireplace, it warms the house. If the fire gets out of the fireplace, it burns down the house. I met Sonia in Atlantic, Iowa. Listen to Sonia's story. The first night of the Thirst Conference brought me to tears for I was that woman at the well looking for satisfaction in human relations. I've been in a two-year sexual relationship. God has convicted me to end this sexual relationship. These lessons on honesty, repentance, and obedience are exactly what God has been telling me for a while now. Through this ministry, I'm ready to act on his word and experience the fullness of an obedient life. She had to acknowledge that she had allowed that relationship to become an idol in her life and turn from it. Here's what uh, Paul said, Philippians 3, 19. Many walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destruction is, their end is destruction and their God. Now notice little g, their God is their belly. When you and I live purely for the gratification through pleasure of our physical needs. Again, what is sin? It's trying to meet a God-given need in a God-forbidden way. When our belly becomes our God, we are in idolatry. Let's look at a second American idol, entertainment. Entertainment. Playing, watching, coaching sports, hunting, fishing, television, the internet, social media, video games, gardening. You say, Greg, now you've gone from preaching to meddling. Now you're, you're hitting a little closer to home than I'm really comfortable with. Again, th- these things are all 
pleasant distractions. They're, they're part of refreshing ourselves physically and emotionally. The problem is when these things become the most important pursuits in our lives. Back when I was in college, there was a popular book that now we see was eerily prophetic. The title of that book was Amusing Ourselves to Death. The author correctly predicted a day that America would be so awash in entertainment that it would become our primary pursuit, distracting us from the higher things, the more needful and lasting and important things. We were leading a conference in Russellville, Kentucky. And it was a longer conference. In our longer conferences, we have time for testimony services. A young man came to the mic and he said, now I'm going to tell you something about me that most of you don't know. I am a celebrity. In the world of video games, he said, I am a celebrity. He literally would travel all around the world competing in video game tournaments, make a lot of money and getting a lot of, of accolades. He said, this week, God has convicted me that video games have become an idol in my life. I've been neglecting my family, my responsibilities as a husband and a father. I've been neglecting the church. I've not been serving and ministering as I should. So he said, this week, I've taken all of my gaming equipment, thousands of dollars. I've given it to my father-in-law. I said, sell it. I have to turn away from that. Now, does everyone need to do that? No. He did, why? Because that video game had become an idol in his life. I was leading a conference in Thomasville, Georgia. Again, a longer conference. We had a testimony service. And I'm standing there and a woman comes to the mic. The first thing she does is look over to her husband and affirms her commitment to him and to their marriage. So immediately I knew that there was a, a story behind that. Here's what I found out later. She was very, very involved with Facebook. Now, let me just be clear. I've got a Facebook account. You want to be my Facebook friend? You can sign up. There's a little card back there that has our information on it. We'd love to be Facebook friends with you, okay? So not against Facebook. But because she was so preoccupied with Facebook, tracing back old relationships, she discovered an old high school sweetheart living a few states away. They began to Facebook message secretly back and forth romantic messages she found herself her heart drawing away from her current husband and back to this high school sweetheart essentially she was committing digital adultery and during the course of the conference god quickened her heart and god convicted her about this and she had now she said i, I broke off that relationship she announced to all of her friends i'm going dark on facebook now, does everyone need to do that? Not necessarily. She needed to do it. Why? It had become an idol in her life. Again, there's a subtlety here because we can be very creative about our idols. One of the uh, reformers described the heart of human beings as an idol-making factory. We have this propensity because of our fallenness. We have this tendency to, again, find ourselves making idols. Had a guy show up one night in one of our services with his golf clubs. Of course, everybody got a chuckle until he came to the mic and announced that God had convicted him that idol had become uh, that golf had become an idol in his life. Now, Pastor, I know you like to golf, and I play a little bit of golf, so I'm not saying that it's sinful to play golf. Well, let me qualify that. If you saw the way that I hit a golf ball, it's close to sinful, all right? I've got this wicked slice, so it's close to sinful. But this guy was a fanatic about golf on the course every day, invested in the latest clubs, and God revealed to him that golf had become an idol in his life. So he was announcing publicly, I'm walking away from golf, I'm going to sell my clubs, and I'm going to give the proceeds to the Revival Love Offering. Does everyone need to do that? No, he did because it had become an idol. Let's talk for a moment about the idol of success. The idol of success, career, status, control, power, fame, politics. Now, hear me clearly. Work is a good thing. Work is a good thing. You know, when we are introduced to God in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, what is God doing? He's working. He's creating 
the heavens and the earth. He creates Adam on the sixth day. First thing he does is put him in the garden and say, go to work, tend the garden. So yes, made in God's image and likeness, we're to work, we're to be productive. Work is a good thing until I begin to attach my primary definition of success to my chosen career. When that becomes my primary definition of success, climbing that ladder of success, at that point I begin to neglect family, I begin to neglect ministry, and at that point, yes, work can become an idol. Here's the sad reality. Someone in the room, I don't know who, someone in the room, you're gonna find yourself working hard climbing that ladder of success. Someday you may find yourself at the very top of that ladder and then the sad reality is going to sink in. Your ladder was leaning on the wrong wall. And so much of what you gave yourself to was for things that aren't eternal in their scope. I met Chris in Hartsville, South Carolina. Listen to Chris's story. Before Life Action came, I thought my job was the most important thing in my life. My profit and loss binder was the most important book in my life. After our revival, I realized that my job was an idol that I was putting in front of God and my family. I've made a commitment to God and my wife that my job would not be my number one priority in my life. He had to make a major course correction. Before he lost that family that he said he loved, he needed to realign his priorities. Reexamine where he was, realign his priorities to line up with God's desire. Here's how Jesus described it, Matthew 16, 26. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? How about the idol of possessions? The idol of possessions. House are for many of us houses. Car, cars, furniture, clothing, collections, bank accounts. God has been so incredibly generous to us as a nation. We're literally awash in material possessions. But again, because of our fallenness, we have this tendency to move our gaze from the giver and to focus instead on the gift. And suddenly these things that up to this point we've claimed were blessings, they can actually become curses in our lives. Listen to this description Colossians 3, 5, and 6. Uh, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is what class? Idolatry. Now, I'm about people, uh, helping people connect dots. Idolatry, covetousness. Covetousness is an expression of idolatry. Now, let's make sure we're on the same page. What do you mean by covetousness? Well, going back to those 10 commandments, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not covet your neighbor's house or any of his possessions. Now, what is coveting? Essentially, I want what you have, not because I need it, but because you have it and I don't. That's coveting. I want what you have, not because I need it, but because you have it and I don't. Very few people, I think, would be open, transparent enough to confess that they were guilty of the sin of coveting. Now, they may say this, if pushed, well, you know, Greg, I'll admit I'm probably a little materialistic. I'm probably a little materialistic. You know, if you have to live in in a certain style home in a certain neighborhood, you have to drive a certain late model car, you have to have a certain level of of clothing and a a certain amount of jewelry, and I just have to have these things, you see, or, or I just don't feel good about myself. We want to call it materialism. Let's call it what God calls it. It's coveting. See if this doesn't ring true with someone. How many of us would say, We're spending money we don't have uh, to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't like. It's entirely possible that you have an idol on your person tonight, that smartphone. Now let me say number one, I'm thankful for my smartphone. Helps me find places like Grove 
Oklahoma. You know, you guys are kind of off the beaten path out here. So I'm thankful for my smartphone. Living on the road, it's a great tool that helps us navigate because Patty and I often eat out. I can't tell you how many times we'll walk into the restaurant, we'll get settled, and I'll start looking at the menu, and I'll look around, and there are couples all around the room, and what are they doing? Are they engaging in meaningful conversation? Are they deepening their relationship? No, I've got to find that latest Facebook post, that latest Pinterest post, that ESPN sport app. It's even a good thing becomes a bad thing if it becomes a ruling thing. If this is robbing you from meaningful relationships with others, if your pursuit of Pinterest, Facebook, or any of those things, if this is becoming an excuse not to spend time with God, not to serve God, and not to deepen relationships, it's possible that you've allowed idolatry in your life. One more. Let's talk about the, idol, uh, the, uh, the potential idol of people. People. Spouse, children, friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, grandchildren. Again, even though people are created in the image and likeness of God, People, again, we need these relationships. We value them. They're so precious to us. If we're not careful, even the good thing of human relationships becomes detrimental if we allow people to become idols in our lives. And by the way, I didn't say this. Jesus said it. Read this with me out loud off the screen. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus says, I claim exclusive right to your heart. You give it to me first and foremost. Again, these things can be subtle. Most women would acknowledge that they have this deep need, a God-given need for love and approval. But hear me, dear sisters in Christ. If you're looking to your husband to meet that deep God-given need of love and approval solely, you're setting yourself up for failure. You're setting him up for failure, setting yourself up for frustration until you have satisfied yourself with God's unconditional love. You will not find the love that you crave. Our children come along. We're so thankful for them now, grandchildren as well. Yes, the scripture says they're gifts from the Lord, but don't forget, they are gifts on loan. They're not yours to keep. We're to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And then we're to release them to pursue God, to pursue the will of God. You know, pastor, I, I, sometimes I'll think I've heard every story and then a pastor will shock me with a new story. I was in South Georgia. This pastor sat me down and said, woo, I just got... Uh, uh, off the phone, a tough conversation with a woman. She was angry at me. She was just really, really critical of me. I said, brother, what did you do to her? He said, I took her daughter on a mission trip. I said, tell me the story. He said, every year we take our high school uh, youth group, as many as are willing to go on a mission trip to South America. We want to introduce them to that world without Christ and believing that God may even call some of them to missions. Well, she participated in the mission trip came home and in her enthusiasm told her mother, I'm asking God to allow me to be a missionary. And what was her mother's reaction? She got mad. Called that pastor and said, you took my daughter to South America. Now she's probably going to leave me and want to raise her children down in South America. Oh, church, never forget. The best place, the safest place is the will of God. If it's the will of God that your child live across town and you get to enjoy their company, God bless you. But if it's the will of God that he plant them in some Muslim country in the Middle East, that's where they need to be. And you and I best guard our hearts lest we become a hindrance, a stumbling block as God might be calling our children to serve him. All right, test number two. Remember, each night our tests are just exercises to help us engage in the truth a little deeper. So some questions here regarding, am I worshiping idols? What am I most afraid of losing? For instance, if you were to answer this question, I can't live without blank. If you have anything other than Christ in that blank, there's a possibility that you have an idol in your life. 
What do I long for and desire most passionately? When you're not guarding your heart, where does it go? Those few moments between waking and sleeping as you're laying in bed, drifting off, where does your mind go? When you're idle, not working, not focusing, where does your mind go? What are your passions? Number three, where do I run for comfort, joy, or satisfaction? Do you run to the refrigerator? Do you run to the liquor cabinet? Do you run to sports center? Where do I run for those things? What or who makes me feel most secure? Again, sisters in Christ, guard yourselves. There's a tendency for a woman who needs and desires a sense of security to look to her husband to meet that need. You're setting him up for failure and you for frustration. Only Christ can give you the security that you need. Finally, what do I brag about? Or next to the last, but what do I brag about? What are you going to be bragging about at work tomorrow? Bragging about the games, gra- bragging about grandchildren? When's the last time you just bragged on Jesus? And, and here the last one, I think this is the real kicker. What do I sacrifice the most for? What or who gets the best of your time, your energy, and your financial resources? If you're willing to be honest with these, uh, about these questions, honest with yourself and honest with God, you may come to that discovery that yes, there's an idol in my life. Some of you have made that discovery tonight. Greg, it's true. I didn't think about it like that. I, no one ever kind of laid it out this way. You're right. I realize there's idols in my life. What do I do? All right, next steps. Number one, repent of your idolatry. Repent of your idolatry. Ezekiel 14, 6, thus says the Lord, repent and turn away from your idols. Now, let me give you a picture here of repentance. All right, I'm walking one way. I stop doing about face and I'm going a different direction. Now, the word repent in scripture literally means to change the mind. You're changing the way you think. But the implication is when I'm changing my mind, I'm changing my thinking, it's changing my lifestyle choices. Have you ever repented? Yeah, Pastor Greg, I I repented. Vacation Bible school, I walked that aisle, repented of my sins, gave my life to Christ. Well, God bless you. But listen, repentance is not limited to your initial salvation experience. Repentance is to be a lifestyle. We're continually repenting. Anytime anything in our lives is outside of the will of God, we're repenting to bring those things back to Christ. Second step. Step number one, repent of your idolatry. Step number two, return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. Here's a promise for someone tonight. You need this. Zechariah 1, 3. Thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you. You say, Greg, I've been away a long time. Return to me, and I will return to you. Well, Greg, I've just squandered my life. I've wasted so much of myself and my possessions. Return to me, and I'll return to you. Going back to our text there in Jeremiah 2.13. Remember they had committed two evils, that brought the judgment. Let's revisit the first one. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. When they stopped walking in fellowship with God, they made themselves vulnerable to the sin of idolatry. Now this is huge. This is the key to overcoming idolatry in your life. The key is pursuing God. That's the key. The key is not in fighting the idol. That's what we want to do. I've just got to muster some self-control. I just need to be more disciplined. No, you don't have the power to break that grip. Only God does. The key comes in returning to the Lord. Mark 12, 30, Jesus answers the question, what's the greatest commandment? Now, I want you to read it with me out loud. And when we come to those little underlying words, say those a little louder for emphasis. Here we go. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, why did I have you do that? We're to love God as he 
deserves to be loved. And that is with the totality of our being. All my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength. Now watch. If I'm loving God as he deserves to be loved, the totality of my being, how much love is left for the idols? There isn't, is there? See, that's the key. Falling in love with Jesus all over again. And that love will destroy the loves that have been robbing you, the loves that are unworthy of you, that love of idols. All right, that brings us to our life in action moment tonight. Lord, I choose to identify and turn from my idols so that I might worship you in spirit and truth. Take that cup, please. You've been curious about that cup, I know. Just like that water jar was a picture of that woman's soul, we're going to let this cup be a picture of your soul. She tried to satisfy herself with substitutes, but substitutes that left her feeling all the more empty. Some of you have tried to satisfy yourself with substitutes, with idols. and God's revealed that to you tonight. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Now, these invitations, by the way, are not traditional invitations. They're not safe invitations. What do you mean by a safe invitation? When you get to sit back there and watch a few people come down here and get right with God, all right? That's a safe invitation. You get to stay in your seat. Well, these invitations are designed to be more inclusive for everybody to participate. Again, the life of God in me produces action like we talked about this morning. You're going to need a pen. If tonight God has convicted you of a specific idol, and when God's conviction comes, it will always be specific. It's like the physician's scalpel taken directly to the tumor. God's cutting out those things in our lives that are not pleasing to him. So when God's conviction comes, it will be very specific. As an act of confession, here's what I'm going to challenge you to do right now. Begin to write on the outside of that cup your idols. You're confessing to God. You're agreeing with God about your idols. Now, of course, class, I need to remind you at this point to keep your eyes on your own cups, okay? It's not your business what God is saying to your neighbor. Give them privacy. You pursue what God is saying to you. So as an act of confession, we've talked about honesty this morning. And again tonight, until you're willing to get honest about where you are spiritually. God's not going to meet that need. You're not going to move on in your walk with Christ. So as an act of confession, just begin to write them. As they come to your mind, just keep writing and keep writing. Just listening quietly. We don't do that very much anymore. We don't listen. Keep writing as God brings them to your mind. Now, at some point, you're going to find a a peace. This is all I'm going to deal with right now. God's saying, you're okay now. We're done. That doesn't mean that the battle's over. That doesn't mean there won't be more idols, but for this moment. You're going to find just a sense of peace, a sense of release. All right, this is what we're going to deal with right now. So going back and confessing, Lord, forgive me for that. Just to prime the pump, let me put up a list of some of the idols we've talked about tonight and others we haven't had time to address. And by the way, the list is not comprehensive. We're so creative about our idols. listening to God, writing down anything that comes to your mind, now going through and confessing and appropriating God's forgiveness. Here's the final thing we're going to do tonight. As a public act of repentance, you've repented in your heart. Greg, God has shown me I'm turning from these idols. As a public act of repentance, I'm going to invite you to come forward. No one's going to ask you any questions. You don't have to have any conversation with anybody. Come forward with that cup. Find you a space here at the front. We're going to let this be the altar tonight. 
find you a space, confess, turn it upside down, leave it on that step and then go back to your seat. There's a picture here. You're emptying your life of idols. A fresh start tonight. Stand with me, please. Who needs to come tonight as an act of public repentance? Say, Greg, I'm repenting of my idols tonight. I've confessed them to the Lord. I'm ready to turn from my idols. I'm ready to return to the Lord. Just come and do business with God. If it gets crowded, just wait for a moment. You'll see a spot open up. You don't have to rush through this. Now, obviously, this is not something you do because people around you are doing it. It needs to be personal. It needs to be intentional on your part. You say, Greg, I'd like to go forward, but physically I can't really do that. Hand your cup to someone and say, would you go for me? I want my cup represented. Would you go for me? And they'll do that. God sees your heart. He's pleased with your heart. Some of you are in a wrestling match right now. That idol has been in your life for so long. You can't imagine yourself free of that idol. You can be. By God's grace, you can be. Let me say, this is not just about you. We have this tendency to pass our idols to our children. They've grown up, they've watched us, they've seen us, and they'll often pick up our idols. Your decision tonight will not just affect you more than likely, it could affect generations of people if the Lord tarries. You're saying no, you're breaking that cycle in your life, that's going to be a blessing that you pass on to your children rather than a burden that you pass on to your children. Wow, look at all those cups, what a precious moment. I don't know a single story. God knows every story. For someone tonight, this is a big deal. I mean, this is a major course correction for you. Again, it's a beginning. It's a beginning. There'll be more battles, but God's going to bless your obedience. Let's just give thanks to the Lord tonight for his goodness to us. <laughs> Pastor Jim, you're going to come and close our service tonight. Again, we gather tomorrow night at 6.30 as we continue this journey together. God bless. Thank you so much for being here. Remember, the services Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday will be at 6.30. And uh, let me encourage you to not only be faithful, this is a wonderful Sunday night crowd, uh, but there are others that need to be here. So let me encourage you to uh, help them, help others. Maybe there's some church members that you know of that are inactive, that have not had an opportunity, maybe they've not been invited or whatever, uh, between now and tomorrow, if God puts somebody in your uh, space, you invite them to be here. We're privileged to have uh, Dr. Scott Hill with us from our uh, association. I'd like for him to come and close us in a word of prayer. Brother Scott. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the good word that we heard tonight, Lord, for uh, the conviction that comes into our hearts because of your love for us, Lord. And Father, for the opportunity for us that you give us daily to repent and turn back to you. Help us, Father, to stay focused always on you and on what you've done for us and what you've called us to be. And Lord, for our purpose. And God, I pray that we would just continue to live out our salvation daily, grow in our relationship with you, and Father, to influence people as best we can with the gospel so that they too can know your love and can experience the joy that we have in our hearts being your children, God. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the rest of this week and the, all of the services, Lord, and bring those whom you would have to be here. Give them spiritual ears to hear with. 
bless the team as they lead this week anoint the preaching and use this time Lord to bring about change in uh, the lives of individuals and hopefully even a great change in our community we love you and we thank you for all that you do for us in Jesus name Amen